The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Thanks for hanging out. Welcome to Tuesday. It's Hale Barn City Radio. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. And can find us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio at Herbal Essence for Elijah. Can watch the show, stream it live if that's your thing. Hale Barn City YouTube channel or the Hale Barn City Radio Twitter feed at HVAR City Radio. Loaded up today. We'll Check in with Mitch Sherman from the Athletic All Things College World Series, Nebraska recruiting, and a really good story by Mitch with Jordy Ball and Rhonda Ravel. So we'll talk with Mitch here in about 15 minutes in hour two. We caught up with Coach Charlie McBride. Coach will be with us in one hour. There was uh, some stuff that needed tending to yesterday on his dock. But we'll, uh, we'll get the full McBride experience here in an hour. And then Matt Schick of ESPN Sirius XM, he'll join us around 525, get his take on the CWS. He's done a lot of national coverage of college baseball this year. What do you think of the series? What do you think of Nebraska recruiting? We maybe even get into a little barbecue discussion with him as he's out in Charlotte. Do you think of, of, of the Carolinas? I do as kind of a barbecue hub. Omaha, BuzzFeed had a story out, talked about it this morning on KFOR, where Omaha came in at number eight as a barbecue town. I think it's underrated as a state, Nebraska, and your usual suspects when it comes to Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas came in there, Memphis, Austin, I mean, you had your your usual folks, Omaha breaking in, but nothing from either North or South Carolina. I know it's a different sauce, not the difference bad. It's a very tasty sauce. A year ago, we were in Winston-Salem this time of year. Tremendous barbecue, good barbecue. I'm more of a dry rub dude, so I don't overly sauce. How many people do you know with smokers that fire up and rib out? A couple of times a month, anyway, when the weather's nice. Oh. Barbecue's here to stay, and people love it. And yeah. it's easier with the the pellet grill options. Yeah, I, and I will say, Carolina. This is so funny. We're having this conversation today because I literally had this conversation last Friday with one of my roommates. We were talking about this because I saw some tweet out there. Your pulled pork is a, a staple, a go-to. It's easy and it's wonderful. Well, yeah, the pulled pork is great, and that is actually where pulled pork pretty much originated in this country was Absolutely. western carolina yeah. western north carolina is where it originated it was where uh these german people came the germans yeah and, and they they took a, a traditional dish which was pork shoulder with a like a, a zingy vinegar based sauce and they kind of melded it with some african-american culture and mm-hmm. uh, and stuff around the carolina area and turned it into this like backwoods barbecue which thing got that taken up? It was a vinegar-based barbecue sauce with a pork shoulder. You pulled it apart, put it on sandwiches. That's where pulled pork originated from. So Carolina is very important there. And then the eastern half of the state, known for its whole hog barbecue, which I have not gotten the chance to try. I'd love to try some Carolina whole hog, along with that Carolina gold sauce, the mustard-based sauce. Yeah, that's the eastern that's part good. of the state, which is iconic. But I kind of get it. I don't put it near the top of my, my barbecue list in this country because you don't think of Carolina barbecue when you think of barbecue in this country, I don't think. Like, sure, it's got the staples, but I think of Kansas City's kind of got the, the sweeter sauces. Mm. That's what I think of with Kansas City. It's like they kind of do, do a little bit of everything, but they're, they're staples. The, their the home sauce. runs the brisket. Texas' home runs the brisket. That's though. true. See, because I, I think of like whenever I, I power rank my barbecue spots, I go start off with number one, Memphis. Okay. I love a Memphis mop the sauce. They do the rib, they do the mop sauce. It is fantastic. And number two, I go probably Kansas City because of the, the the regionality of it. I can get to Kansas City, and and that's what a lot of the barbecue around here is originated off of is, is Kansas City. And then I think I go down to Texas because Texas is its weird own thing where it's like salt and black pepper only on the rub. If they do do a sauce, it's like a, a black pepper-based mm-hmm. sauce. 
Uh, got a little. It's kind of more my alley. Give me yeah. more of the rub and, and go from and, there. It's not my thing, but I understand the, the iconicness of it. I, I don't think you can leave Carolina off of the list though, because of the history. I mean, barbecue in this country really originated in the Carolinas. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. We'll get Schick's perspective on it. Let's get your perspective. Speaking of barbecue, I think I want, uh, I, I will do one of those tomahawk oh bone-in steaks because somebody picked LSU, somebody picked Florida, and the steak and the beer bet, the series was won in emphatic fashion by those Bayou Bengals. How about this? I have a really, really good steak sandwich recipe. Ribeye steak, I, I smoke it up to temperature. Okay. I make a homemade mayonnaise to put on you don't there. Put mayo on beef, yes. brother. Yes. Trust me. Trust me. It's it's less about the flavor and more about you put a barrier between your greasy meat and your bread so the bread doesn't get soggy that way. Kind of it's oh. the oil kind of acts as a barrier between your bread and your your greasy meat and cheese. Yeah, trust me. I got I got a good recipe. I'll make you one. Or I could just give you my I could give uh I'm not going to give you my steak recipe. But I could cook on one of my steaks for you. Smoke it up to temperature, reverse sear it that way. Okay. Get a little compound we're, we're butter talking, on there. We're talking. We're, we're, we're going all food here. Yeah, but I'm just trying to avoid the, the, the main topic of conversation here, which is I was completely off on my steak and a beer bet last you're, night. You're fine. It, I got absolutely happened. killed. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Hey, LSU, uh, another championship, championship number seven. We'll get some of Mitch Sherman's thoughts. I, it was batting practice, and it was batting practice – the last two days, one day for Florida, one day for LSU, but it was exciting. You had a, a bit of a late arriving crowd, but then it filled up and it was a party. So there we have it. And the, uh, the, the year was great. Baseball was fun. It was exciting, but it really came to a crescendo with attendance and then TV viewership was, was big time for uh, ESPN and college baseball. I mean, folks were really tuned into the CWS, and it was it was as good as advertised. What's Nebraska's recruiting class doing? Uh, well, 2024 continues to ramp up and amp up. Commit number 20 a little bit earlier today. Quinn Clark is in, and stop me if you've heard me talk about this before, but Quinn Clark is a kid that Nebraska invited this was the, uh, the the June 11th and 12th weekend where Quinn Clark's a wide out from Bozeman, Montana. If you know Nebraska football, his uh, late great father, Ken Clark, incredible running back 87 through 89, outperformed Barry Sanders in that famed 88 duel. Uh, Quinn Clark got an offer after just a handful of routes by Matt Rule. Nebraska wanted three wide receivers in this 2024 class. They now have three receivers, Hall, McMorris, and Clark, all different body types and specialties, right? And you have Quinn Clark at 6'5", 190, just shy of 1,000 yards as a junior in Bozeman, Montana. 15 touchdowns is film, uh, screams Randy Moss tribute because of all the jump balls, and uh, the ability to, to high point the football and go get it. So he did have a couple of monster FCS offers. That's Montana, Montana State, Portland State interested. Wyoming was sniffing around. And this is a case where he's ranked per 24-7 as a three-star, but no rankings yet with some of the other services. No rankings with On3, no rankings with ESPN, no rankings with rivals. That may bother some of you. But again, this is Matt Rule saying, I like what I see. Son, would you like to play football for Nebraska? This isn't charity. This isn't, oh, your dad was a great back in the late 80s. Let us take care of you. This was earned on the field. This was an invite to camp to get a better look at a six foot five wide receiver. And then he impressed. He earned the offer in camp. And good for him. Uh, good for Quinn Clark, really talented kid. And Nebraska's happy with their receiver group for 2024. And you have to wonder this. Nebraska is doing what, Elijah? They are continuing to work. And you wonder if Nebraska was was first versus, well, I mean, clearly they were first, but just as far as getting him on the radar, 
before he was on a BYU's radar Mm -hmm. or a Boise State's radar or a Utah's radar or an Oregon radar, Washington, Washington State. The Big Sky region uh, is not known for producing uh, a large quantity, but there is quality. And you look at all the kids that go to Montana or Montana State or Portland State that that flourish in the NFL. You just happen to get a six foot five Husker legacy to say yes today for Nebraska and excited to see. They can also do what they want here. If if they want to put some weight on the kid. That's yep. If they want to put some weight on the kid, guess what? Maybe you got another uh hybrid flex guy or dare I even say tight end. And that is kind of where my mind went because of something we heard from Rule a couple of months ago. I can't remember which podcast he sat down with, but we heard it here on this show where he said, hey, whenever I was working with, with defenses, not only in college, but the NFL, the number one thing that they're worried about is speed beating them over the top, getting burnt deep and, you know, it's 70 yards for a touchdown because your corner or your safety can't keep up with the guy running 4-3. That is not the mold that Quinn Clark is cut from. I'm not calling him slow, not by any means. He, he's still a, a great athlete. But he doesn't follow that mold of, He's what, not a we, guy. of what we've seen. Jalen Lloyd, Malachi Coleman, uh, Davon Hall, Isaiah McMorris. All these guys have real track speed that they have shown not only on the football field, but also uh, in either electronically timed 40s or running the 100 or 200 meter dash. Like Those are what type of guys those are. Quinn Clark doesn't necessarily fit that mold. And again, I don't want to call him slow. And Matt Rule's had success in his career with possession wide receivers that don't take the tops off defenses. So I'm not saying he's not going to be a wide receiver. But that was also the first place my mind went with a 6'5 frame. I wonder if you start him out at wide receiver at Nebraska and then say, hey, hey kid, you're sitting fourth in the depth chart here, but we could really use an edge rusher or we could really use an outside linebacker. And we think your athleticism is really going to work out for us well there. I wonder if he's a guy that is listed by the recruiting services as a wide receiver, but Nebraska sees him more as an athlete, a guy that could go in a couple different places. His wide receiver tape is very impressive. His ability to go high point footballs, his ability to to make the catch in traffic and drag a couple guys five yards before going down, making sure you get that first down. You can see all that on film. I think he's a talented wide receiver, but I, I'm in the same boat as you where I wonder if the coaching staff knows in the back of their mind a position switch could be a possibility if he doesn't quite fit the mold of what the other wide receivers are at Nebraska. Well, and, and just because you're, you're not track fast in comparison to some of these guys that run – 10 500s you can still put on some weight and still be damn tight end fast <laughs> right if you put some weight on a, on a on a kid like this and you know it's just a matter of of projecting and can the frame hold it and here's where we think you could uh succeed and uh just a different tune per se for you and, and uh, like being fast is not the be all end all to being a wide receiver you got to be football fast i mean mm-hmm. you have the freaks randy moss ran like what a four three at the combine same with calvin johnson maybe two uh, for randy yeah and then you look at jerry rice the best wide receiver of all time statistically he ran a four seven at the nfl mm-hmm. combine so let's not act like you have to run four three four four to be a six, successful wide receiver. I think in a six five frame kind of works out a little bit better there. But I just think there is possibility should it come to that of a guy maybe flipping over to defense being an edge rusher. Well, and and they loved his route running, uh, his ability. He's precise. I mean, he'll be able to to get open with that size anyway. If you want to throw a jump ball to him, but just when it comes to route running, feels like he was pretty advanced not only to get this offer, but Nebraska really excited to get um, Quinn Clark in to the boat here for 2024. We'll spend some time with the recruiting storylines. Carter Nelson announcing tomorrow at noon. Uh, How do you feel about that? Uh, If you're a Nebraska fan, I think we all are hedging our bets toward uh, Nebraska landing the top player in the state in, in the second best tight end per the services in the country. We'll know officially tomorrow as the uh, the standout from Ainsworth will make his announcement. Uh, Excited to react to that, knowing I think that it's going to be a good thing for Nebraska. That's that's our bet. That's our take. Uh, Not that we have any inside info or anything, but Nebraska is really accelerated here as you, you look back to June 7th, where they were sitting at you know, single digit commitments and how June has transpired all to plan, by the way, Nebraska knew where they were at. 
they wanted to take time and evaluate. And then once they felt good relationship-wise and fit-wise about the kids, they got to see the offers went out. They closed the deal with the kids. And now you're, you're sitting at 20 and presumably number 21 tomorrow. And there may be more the rest of this week uh, as we uh, have a, a dead period in recruiting. And there's some time off for the coaches here up until uh, probably the 10th or 11th of July. Mm -hmm. But Nebraska could have their class almost finished out. They're still waiting on a couple of offensive tackles, we think. And I think they're good with the wideouts. They're good with the running back. They've got their quarterback. But offensive line right now is is probably the focus. Yeah, and and this is something we kind of talked about briefly yesterday. When you look back at the 2023 class plus 2024, I think there's some help that could be – I mean, you did a great job on linebackers and defensive line in that class last year. This year you've done really well in the defensive back room as well as the wide receivers. You got yourself a running back. You got yourself a quarterback. You got yourself two, maybe three tight ends. Mm -hmm. It really – oh, and let's not forget, a kicker and a punter as well. Yep. So it leaves offensive line help being maybe the last thing. But I think Nebraska probably feels pretty good about where their class is at right now. Nope, and you get uh, Bricks and Baker. That'd be... That'd be huge. Baker, Baker would be, be big. I know. That's I know. a huge pull. That, that, but, but, that's a that's a big Oregon lean. That, that's that's <laughs> that's a that's a big ask right now. But Nebraska will keep chopping wood there. Good to be with you on a Tuesday. Can always catch the podcast here, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play with Hale Varsity Radio. Subscribe to it. Doesn't cost you anything. Mitch Sherman next from the Athletic as we continue with Hale Varsity presented by Kirk. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by Currency. Matt Schick going to be with us here in an hour. We welcome in with the athletic. Mitch Sherman joins us at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, how's your Tuesday? Thanks for a few minutes. My Tuesday is good. How are you? We're good, man. We are... Uh, a little sad the College World Series is done. Uh, what a run it was and uh, an emphatic finish offensively. You've seen the CWS for years. What did you think of the 2023 version? Well, you know, for 14 games, we had really competitive baseball that was nail-biting and down to the wire every day. Great pitching performances, clutch hitting on offense. Great defense and, you know, walk-offs, uh, shutouts, um, power pitching, power arms, and something was out of whack the last two games, which was unfortunate because those are the two where there was a national championship at stake on Sunday for LSU and then on Monday for both teams. And we had a 24-4 to game, as you know, and then an 18-4 to game. So the, the margin of victory – in those two, in those last two games, uh, exceeded the first 14 um, combined. So that was that was not what I, I would have have wanted. But um, we certainly saw an offensive explosion from Florida on Sunday and then from LSU on Monday. Um, it, I don't think it it, it uh, by any means ruined what we had for two weeks. But um, would like to see that competitive nail-biting baseball have gone down to the to the end it, at the end lsu um i think just was the best team and i think that was the case from the beginning of the season the tigers did go through a little bit of a slump late and you know wake forest was certainly worthy of that number one ranking coming into omaha but um lsu beat them head to head back to back on wednesday and thursday to get into the finals and um deserved to be there and deserved to win it Mitch, I've heard some people say that they think that the College World Series finals would have been more competitive if you give these teams a week off and uh, you bring them back to Omaha a week after the, the first round of games so you get the final set and then you go Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the next weekend, make sure all the pitchers are ready to go, make sure all the players are rested up, and hey, you can even give the, some fans back home a chance to, to make some plans to make it to Omaha for the final series. What, what would your reaction be to that? Do you think Omaha and the College World Series should consider going to a format where the, the finals are played after the, the first round of games? Ooh. Um, you know, I mean, they've made efforts to, to contract it in the last couple of years mm-hmm. so that you're not going into a Monday, Tuesday, possibly Wednesday kind of situation. You know, baseball is a sport that at the – highest levels is meant to be played just about every day and the rosters on these teams 
in the SEC and at the high levels, especially now with the transfer portal, are so deep and the pitching staffs are deep that, yeah, it would have been nice to see Paul Skeens on the mound for sure in the, the best of three championship series. But then you're getting into July and, you know, you have the 4th of July. And I think the people of Omaha need to move on by July um, from supporting this thing. And, and it's great in June. I, you know, it would take some getting used to. I'm not saying that it, it couldn't work, but I also think you have to consider everyone involved. I, I don't know. I think there would be more negatives to that than positives to send people home and then bring them back after a week. It just, it just seems very much unnatural in, in comparison, obviously, to what we're used to. And really, I, I don't know that the problem that we had the last two days had all that much to do with players being tired or pitching staffs being depleted. In fact, Florida's pitching staff was set up well for the, for the championship series because the Gators played just three games, or, I'm sorry, four games to get to the finals. Or was it three? I, I think it was three. But <laughs> um, it, they were not packed. It was three, and LSU played five. So I, I don't think they needed a week off or five days off. Um, LSU's pitching staff was more depleted because it came through the loser's bracket, but um, not so much to the point that the Tigers couldn't handle it. I don't think the problems that LSU had on the mound on Sunday were related to a pitching staff that was out of gas. Mitch Sherman's with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Mitch, uh, a thought with recruiting going to shift up on you. And Nebraska has accelerated now to, to 20 verbal commits for 2024. You have uh, Quinn Clark making his commitment today. Uh, you have uh, a trio of, of Bell West standouts, of course, with uh, Davon Hall and McMorris uh, Friday. Uh, did theirs on Instagram. Uh, likely or possibly uh, an announcement from Carter Nelson towards Nebraska tomorrow. We'll wait and see at noon there. But your reaction here, I mean, we, 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 we rewind here a few weeks and Nebraska's in single digits. And it's been downhill in a great way for Nebraska and Coach Rule here as they, uh, they head to July. Yeah, 20 commits at the end of June, well, and likely more than 20. I mean, if you get Carter Nelson tomorrow as the cherry on top to what has been the, the month of June, I mean, it's going to go down as, at least right now, I mean, recruiting is always a let's check back in three years kind of situation. But for right now, it, it just looks like, you know, Nebraska has done a great job of executing the plan that it wanted to execute. And I recognize that there are some players some prospects in this group that weren't necessarily hard gets for Nebraska. I mean, when you're recruiting against Eastern Illinois and Missouri Western, um, it isn't necessarily about winning the battle and, you know, going toe to toe with the competition. The battle is more internal and in, in doing the job that you need to do in evaluations and in finding players and overturning rocks that haven't been overturned by other programs around the region. And, you know, all we can do right now is, is either believe or not believe that Matt Rule and his staff have done that. And historically, that is what they've done in recruiting, is go out and find players because they've needed to do that at Temple and Baylor in Pennsylvania and in Texas, if you're not Penn State or Texas, they've needed to go out and find players that the top programs were not looking for. And they still have the ability to do that. They're not going to sign a class of 25 of those guys, but obviously they see things athletically in some of the guys that they've got commitments from who are not Davon Hall or Isaiah McMorris or Carter Nelson or Mario Buford this month. They see things in the other guys that they really believe in and they trust in their evaluation. So let's see what happens. Um, I'm intrigued. You know, these guys are still athletes just because they don't have four stars by their names. They, some of these guys are still running four five and under forties and, you know, high jumping seven feet and putting up numbers that would look great at an NFL combine. And they have the raw skills that these coaches feel that they can build winners with. So, if you want to believe that right now, then I think you have to look at this month of June, especially if Carter Nelson comes on board tomorrow, as being a big step toward what Matt Rule is trying to build in Lincoln. Mitch, 
it feels like this class really took a, a turn for the better when Matt Rule and staff secured the commitment of Daniel Kalen. Is that causation or correlation, do you think? Do you think that this class has come together because of Daniel Kalen, or do you think that was just a, a part of this class coming together, if you understand what I'm trying to ask you here? Yeah, I do think you need a quarterback to really get things going. And if you look at the class now, the 20 commit, 10 of them are on offense, and only three of those offensive players were on board before Danny Kalen uh, joined the class at the end of May. I mean, clearly you don't have the same kind of in with Davon Hall and Isaiah McMorris and Carter Nelson if you don't get Danny Kalen. I'm not saying that everybody on the offensive side committed because of him, but it's important. That's why quarterbacks commit early. It's important to have a quarterback – that you can sell to your your other recruits on the offensive side, especially, but really all over the team, because just just how important the quarterback is to the makeup of a roster. So, um, and then you add in the fact that the personality of Danny Kalen, the fact that he was in Lincoln um, for other official visit weekends, for unofficial visits to help host players after he committed. He's been a great advocate. Um, alongside this coaching staff to help move things along in the month of June. Um, and the performance that he had at the Elite 11 Finals, I think, legitimized what the Nebraska coaches believed about Daniel Kalen coming into the month of June. So um, I've, got, I've got, you know, it's a great question, and I've got some more on that coming out tomorrow morning on The Athletic. I was at Bellevue West this morning and, and had a little roundtable discussion with Danny and Isaiah and Dave Vaughn. Um, to hear about their weekend and their thoughts on, on everything that's happened this month and, and while they were on campus uh, last weekend. So that'll be out uh, tomorrow morning on The Athletic. Man, that'll be a great read. Mitch Sherman with us from The Athletic, at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, real quick, uh, I know you, you posted a story here uh, with Jordy Ball and uh, kind of detailed uh, that question and the answer, you know, why leave such a great situation in Oklahoma? Give folks a little snippet, if you could, about uh, your story on Jordy. Yeah, I think people heard her at the press conference last Tuesday and heard Ronda Ravel um, at Memorial Stadium talk about some of the reasons that she was motivated to leave Oklahoma after winning two national championships and being the most outstanding player at the Women's College World Series uh, this spring. Um, you know, this story, i I think goes a lot deeper into into some of those reasons, and I was able to sit down with Jordy and sit down with Rhonda and Billy Andrews, who was a teammate in the past of of Jordy and a teammate in the in the future of her at Nebraska, the All Big Ten shortstop for the Huskers, and talked to Jordy's dad, Dave Ball, who's a firefighter in Papillion, and some of her high school and and, and club coaches and, and people that she's been associated with in the Nebraska softball community. I, I think it really paints a picture that's genuine. And, and gives a great indicator, um, you know, a great, a great um, uh, there's, there, if you read the story, I think you're really going to understand a lot more about who she is and, you know, what she's bringing back home to Nebraska with this transfer from Oklahoma. Mitch, about 30 seconds, you got a weekend of baseball or do you get a little break? I do have a weekend of baseball, Schmitty. I got a state tournament upcoming, so. Ooh. Looking forward to that, and uh, that'll be it for for uh, the foreseeable future until fall, I guess. So it's go, go, go for six months with baseball, and then it's coming to an end right before the 4th of July. So wish me luck that I, I keep my wits about me <laughs> and uh, er- everything goes well, and, and thanks for asking. Good luck to you with uh, – whatever baseball endeavors you might have yourself. We, uh, we head to uh, the home of John Wayne here right after the 4th, and then we are gearing up for state. So we got a little breather here. Mitch, take care. Best to you and, and uh, the baseball team, and we'll check in here down the road. Thanks for the time. Okay, thanks, guys. Take care. There he is, Mitch Sherman with The Athletic. Got to got to read that tomorrow uh, with his roundtable with Kalen Hall McMorris. Good stuff, as always, from Mitch. Charlie McBride, 20 minutes away. He's coming up. Matt Schick will join us next hour. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Big thanks to Mitch Sherman. His full interview will be on the podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. If you want to catch up with Hale Varsity Radio, either the, hey, the segment you want to hear or the full show there 
audio-wise, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or yes, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Hale Varsity uh, is where you go for that on YouTube and the Twitter feed from Hale Varsity Radio at H Varsity Radio. Reminder about your friends at Dyer Law. Congratulations to Dyer Law. They took fight in front of a federal jury in Omaha, and after days of testimony, the jury awarded their client $3 million in damages, which is huge. You can trust in the team at Dyer Law to help ensure that your rights are protected and you get the settlement you deserve. Call Dyer Law today, 402-393-7529, or visit Dyer.Law to chat with the trusted professionals about your claim. Dyer.Law, log on today, or call up Dyer Law at 402-393-7529. So Matt Schick is going to be with us less than an hour. Coach McBride's about 20 minutes away. We've spent time here talking about Clark, the latest commitment, and Carter Nelson. And and where are you at as a Nebraska fan? I, I don't think you you can brush past the accomplishment of, of getting a, a four-plus star tight end from anywhere. I think there's still a segment of the population that says, well, small town Nebraska, the kid should be a Husker. Easier to say, much easier to say 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago, 25 years ago. No brainer. The Jay Moores of the world coming to Lincoln. The Amon Greens of the world coming to Lincoln. Not that there wasn't a fight for him, but you got him. Well, Carter Nelson uh, could signify that Nebraska is done fooling around. It already signifies, in short order with Rule and his staff, that you get McMorris in the boat, when he wasn't even fishing hmm. <laughs> in, in the Nebraska pond. Same with Hall five months ago, six months ago. When we talked to Coach Huffman after the uh, the Danny Kalen commit. He, he had hinted to us on the show about just that, you know, the work that, that Garrett McGuire's done. And that's been detailed by a lot of the, the tremendous recruiting writers and Brady Oltman's, of course, with Hale Varsity, Mitch Sherman as well. And, you know, the, this is is how it's supposed to go, Elijah. But man, it is easy to take it for granted, and that's just something that Nebraska can't do anymore, and and never really should have gotten into the mode of taking taken for granted the in-state kids that that want to come and play for 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 Nebraska because Nebraska has not done their part. Nebraska has not done their part on the field for years and Nebraska has maybe not done their due diligence, not every coach or not every staff, but as a whole, you've just had some missteps and for whatever reason, you got a stud signal caller going down to Oklahoma state Flores from, Mm -hmm. from Gretna. Uh, You've got uh, Noah Fant is, is a recent example of a first round talent that, Goes to Iowa. You've got other examples of kids going to Iowa. Or Easton Stick, the Creighton Prep quarterback, who went and balled out State. for North Dakota mm-hmm. State. You've got, uh, you know. My guy we talked about last week, Christian Lokacher. I know he was only here briefly, but he was an in state kid while he was here, and you lose him to LSU after he came here because he was committed to Nebraska. He went to play with Bando. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and then look at look at uh, uh, some of the talent from, from previous uh, Bell West receiving cores. I mean, they found their way to Iowa or other schools, Wyoming, and and done well. Uh, a couple of kids are in the NFL. So Nebraska has come in with Rule and his staff and absolutely zeroed in on Nebraska and beyond in that 500-mile radius. And Rule's talked about it. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to do. And they've done a really pretty good job. And Mitch is right. What's the, what's the tab look like in three years? Mm-hmm. Is the tab comped in a great way because, wow, these kids have performed and produced and been developed, or did you miss? You're going to have misses. But the point is, is you don't want that ratio to be horrible. 
And part of the problem with missing, and it, it could be beyond the kid just can't play, it's, oh, the kid is tired of your BS or they're going to go somewhere else in the era of the portal, and you don't even get a chance to coach them up because they're gone in a year. Well, the problem is within the past decade, there's been more Nebraska kids that have been drafted after going to other schools than Nebraska kids who have gone to Nebraska and been and drafted. drafted. Mm-hmm. And it's not close. Who, who are the in-state kids that have been drafted from Nebraska in the past decade? Cam Jurgens, right at the top of the mm-hmm. list. Uh, Austin Allen. Austin Allen got drafted, correct? Or no, was he undrafted? Free, free agent deal. Undrafted let's, free agent. let's expand to NFL. Kids that went to the NFL either drafted or free agency. So Cam, Austin Allen. Garrett Nelson. Okay. Ooh, and we're running out of names that are off the top of my head. That's okay. Those are three. Those are three. And, and, you know, feel free to chime in if we're missing an obvious, and we probably are. I mean, a decade's a long time to go back. No, it is. It is, but, I mean, you've seen it dwindle in the draft. Where, I mean, for the love of God, Nebraska's draft streak was snapped. Where you'd been going 50-plus years. So... Kudos to the work Nebraska's done. Uh, let's see the development happen. I'm fascinated to get Coach McBride's insight on this because uh, when he was recruiting, yeah, there was Max Prep or there was Blue Chip. There was a, a publication out that, that listed the top 50, but Nebraska went on their own evaluations. If that name so happened to be a super prep player, so be it. <laughs> the world knew Amon Green was number one or two running back in the Midwest, if not the country. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> you got to go get him. But to, to what Mitch talked about, you're turning over every rock and you're going to go get kids that you think have some talent and let's coach them up and get them better. And wow, uh, you have the Hassan Reddicks of the world. And if you get that in Lincoln, and you combine that with some known quantities of three or four, or dare I even say five stars someday, that's a great combination where you've got the best of both worlds, your ability to evaluate, attract, and develop a player, and then also go get the kid that is more ready-made or more college-ready than the, the, uh, the, the two-star development kid. I mean, Brandon Riley. Case in point, he didn't have much of a star rating, but a hell of a wide receiver, talented kid, and had a great career in Lincoln and, and was right there uh, every offseason trying to make an NFL roster with his size and toughness at wide receiver and his speed. So uh, there's a lot of those instances that make Nebraska fans smile out there where kids uh, were overlooked or it was just a, a Nebraska case study where we'll take you as a walk-on or Maybe you're from a smaller school, but, man, you, you can come in and perform. Uh, we'll see where that story finishes tomorrow with Carter Nelson's announcement. Quickly, we've got one big name from the brass kids, Luke Gifford. Gif? How can well, we forget? That's, that's on you. <laughs> uh, hour one winds down next. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time this hour, it's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. Some other guys that got away from Lincoln, uh, Greg Zerline, uh, coulda, shoulda, woulda, stud kicker, ball player from Pius, uh, was at UNO, and then I think South Dakota State or South Dakota, one of the two, and he uh, he, he was not a, a walk-on option for Nebraska for whatever reason in the Callahan era. Uh, you've got uh, Sha- Shaquille Barrett, stud uh, outside backer, Russian extraordinaire, was a Boys Town kid that ended up at Colorado State after going to UNO. So Barrett's another example uh, that we were talking about. And then probably the all-timer, you may hear him next week on a best of, Danny Woodhead. Mm. <laughs> well. I had a couple other names that came to that mind, too. That guy. Danny Woodhead's huge, but how about Harrison Phillips? He's still playing in the NFL right now. Yeah, after Harrison's on a third contract. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a he's a, he's a a Millard West kid, and he's a Steve Warren Academy kid. Yeah, he's a, a three-star 
uh, at the time. They needed to put some weight on him. Stanford did just that, and they actually and he him. played great. I mean, Stanford ran a three four. Yeah, and and he was brought in to be a defensive end. They ended up moving him to nose guard, putting mm-hmm. a whole bunch of weight on him. I think he got 50, 60 pounds. And guess he what? He did really well at Stanford under Shaw. Yeah, really, really well. I think he parlayed it into a third round draft selection, second second round draft selection, and he uh, is on his second contract in the NFL, doing great things. Uh, and like, I remember talking to Harrison on signing day and then also on draft day, like after draft day. And then he always comes back to the community and, and helps out and does camps and he'll do a youth thing. And that's really impressive. No offense. So, another notable one. I actually saw him over the weekend at the College World Series. Yeah. How would he say to you? Hanging out. No, I didn't say hi to him, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say hi to him. That's an all time recruiting story. Well, like, like, what was I going to say? Like, the, the, no shade at all here intended at least like but like the only thing that came to mind was yeah you put up zeros on my fantasy team when you were with the broncos As man. he and that, launches that, you <laughs> from the third deck and that's what i'm saying up, like i am Elijah. not i'm not gonna go there because the dude's a, a phenomenal athlete i liked him in denver and i think he'll be okay in seattle he's been okay in seattle yeah. don't, don't get me wrong he's on my fantasy team again last year i keep on picking him for a reason like i think he's got great potential but like that's the defining memory is like man i really had to work for my uh my tight end spot back in 2021 Thought you were going to be the lockdown starter. What's What's funny is every time they'd roll in during the Riley era, it was three touchdowns for Noah Fant on purpose. Yep. Like the only time Baby Ferentz would call his number was in Lincoln, just to pour gallons of salt in said wound. Just like when you know Ohio State would be up by forty, uh, and oh, let's put Joe in. Let Let, let Joe run some. Some waggle and uh, quarterback keep, and Joe Burrow had three touchdowns, I believe. Well, back back to Fant. Who could forget? I think they're already up by thirty at this point, and they run like a little out swing route to to Noah Fant. He takes it seventy yards to the house to put the nail in the coffin. I was in the stadium that day. That one sucked. <laughs> that coffin was already closed, man. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was done. It was done, and it was cold, and there wasn't enough beer in the world. For Nebraska fans, and I don't blame you. Well, we'll check in with Charlie McBride. The secret to in-state success is what? Well, we'll talk to Charlie about that. The impact of a of a yes from Carter Nelson tomorrow for Nebraska football. Matt Schick with us next hour, hour two on the way. It's Hale Varsity, and we're presented by Currency. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Back with you, Tower 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbert. We say hi to Mr. Blackshirt himself. Charlie McBride joins us here on a Tuesday. Coach, how was the weekend? Thanks for a few minutes today. Well, it was good. That, except, for, except for the rain, I guess. You know, I got to, two of my family came and so that makes it better. A little more activity. That is good. That is good. Are you are you catching fish or are you just watching others catch fish and do some boating? That, that, is the weather good? Well, I'll I tell you what I did. I, I, Saturday morning, I got my binoculars out, and I just watched a couple of guys catch fish, and so that's that's good. I have not fished this weekend at mm-hmm. all. But that's because I'm lazy. <laughs> You're just letting others have a shot, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. I just I just been kind of rolling with the wind here around here. It's been bad, and it's you know it's kind of uncomfortable for those guys out on the lake sure. anyway. Well, Coach McBride with us, Coach. Uh, busy recruiting stretch for Nebraska as we look at the month of June. And Nebraska was at single digits in commitments at the start of the month. And after today, they are up to, to 20 already. And uh, the latest wow. is uh, a legacy 
Uh, and I wanted to get your thoughts here on, on Ken Clark because uh, his son uh, committed today to Nebraska as uh, the third wide receiver of the 2024 class. Uh, pretty impressive for Nebraska to get not only a legacy, but a kid they really liked from what they saw in camp. Well, their their uh, kids are usually better than their fathers. <laughs> <laughs> please, my, please, mine have been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, that's really great. I mean, that, that you know, along with you know, a, a young kid, Dicky, the fullback that's going to mm-hmm. walk on. I mean, when when a kid says that's his dream that he's always wanted to be in the, at Nebraska and everything. That that makes a big difference, uh, you know. And it, I'll tell you where it helps is on the goal line, mm-hmm. you know. And I mean, those are the kind of kids you want around, the kids that really want to be here and really are giving it everything they got. And plus, their parents are, you know, they're a lot of these kids are playing for their parents, you know. I mean, they really really work at it, and uh, so I, I'm really happy to see it. I'm happy. I'm, I know um, his dad would be pretty thrilled if he knew. Charlie McBride's with us, Hail Varsity Radio. Coach, I wanted to get your thoughts. We don't know what the announcement's going to be with Carter Nelson, the really talented tight end. Uh, he's uh, is as good as it gets uh, from a ranking standpoint, but he's a uh, He's an eight-man kid with worlds of talent. It's been a fight because everybody from Nick Saban to Notre Dame has been by to see him, and I think Nebraska's got a good shot. What does what would it mean to you for Nebraska to get such a high-profile recruit, even though he's an in-state kid? Well, I think that's well, that's the, that's the key to it. I mean, I think the out-of-state kids, you, you know, you don't know. I think you still. I, I think it's in some ways still an open market, even after they commit. I, I worry a little mm-hmm. bit about some of that. You know, some of these guys and other schools that uh, you know kind of keep pushing. But mm-hmm. uh, I, if we could get him, that that would just that would be the best. I mean, you know, it it would make the uh, uh, kind of put the frosting on the cake of the, of, of the recruiting and. A young kid like that, um, I think that those are the kind of people. It's like you'd say you have to get them, mm-hmm. and you you know if you don't, that's a different thing. And I always said though that uh, when when I first came here, we lost a kid to Iowa, and mm-hmm. we lost a kid a couple of years later from uh, from uh, Creighton Prep mm-hmm. to Notre Dame, and the parents were uh, adamant. And, and they were really nice people. I mean, it, it, this big old tackle, and uh, they 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 just said that he's been in a parochial school uh, all his life, and they'd like him to stay in one. And he ended up going to Notre Dame, which I didn't have any arguments with that. Mm-hmm. I don't think you can argue anything like that when you have the family behind you like that. And I I think that's a big plus too when you have your folks behind you. I know that I had a little bit of a toggle with my folks going to Colorado from Chicago. It was, uh, you know, if I had it to do all over again and know what I know, I don't know about, about my decision. But it's I have some great friends, and, you know, that, that's where you make a lot of good friends, and, you know, a lot of guys will spend their lives here, mm-hmm. especially the guys from out of state. It's really funny how they stay. Some of the guys from the state leave, but uh, I think uh, job opportunities in Nebraska are just going to get better and better. Charlie, whenever you look back at Nebraska's previous recruiting weekend, they had 14 kids on campus. They started the weekend with seven of them committed, I guess nine if you want to count uh, both Davon Hall and Isaiah McMorris. They're now up to 11 of the 14 committed as a coach. What would that make you feel? You know, this is supposed to be your, your big summer recruiting weekend. You have 14 kids on campus, and before the, the end of the week, 11 of them are already committed, and possibly 12 by tomorrow. Well, I think, you know, the biggest thing is is you, when you have that many kids on campus, you feel good about 
the fact that uh, you 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 ought to, as a coach, maybe you ought to keep your mouth shut <laughs> and let the players do the talking. Mm-hmm. You know, because they're the ones that are going to be on the field together, and um, I think that's really important that you know the guys you're going to play with, and and you have a feeling for them even before you get here. That's that's really an, an advantage to your program because a lot of times you know you get kids, and, and I've had them, you know, from out from nowhere. He just walks in here, and it's it's really tough on them. And then, you know, they're wondering, the first thing they say is, what am I doing here? And and so you have to, as a coach and a staff, you have to really keep your eye on a lot of kids from a distance. Coach, what do you think about this staff, their plan, and their execution where they have invited kids they've seen on film, they've gotten kids to camp, They've evaluated in person, and then they've extended the offer. It sounds sounds familiar. I mean, were, were, did you guys work like that? Yeah, right. It's familiar. You're, yeah, we sure did. We we had our camp was a little bit longer than most of them. In fact, we got really a pretty good look at them because ours was a good solid three days with mm-hmm. uh, you know one one uh, testing day, and then of course we released them on the last. But they were they worked you know, a good two and a half days as far as as far as our drills and things we wanted to see and and so there were a lot of guys that we uh uh you know it helped on our walk on program and it helped in our scholarship program. And when you know you're working with kids uh, you know, in your position and you can go into a meeting and say, Hey, we better take a look at this guy or we better take a look at that guy and somebody'll you know the same thing about their positions and so you may end up with 10 or 15 kids right off the bat you know and and then you test them and you find out a lot more about them too so you know it when you have them and you get a a feel for their personality and and how they get along with others it's it makes a big big difference Charlie McBride's with us here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. And, uh, Charlie, we got some breaking news in here from Brady Oltmans of Hale Varsity. You can find him on Twitter, at Brady Oltmans. Uh, in total, 108 Huskers this year earned the Big Ten Distinguished Scholar Awards. Uh, of those 108, 10 were football players, meaning they recorded a GPA of 3.7 or better. I want to get your take. What's the importance of having guys that not only are high-level football players, but high-level scholars as well? That's something that Matt Rule has emphasized uh, during his first few months on campus. Now, I'm going to get your take. Well, what's the importance of having scholars in addition to football players on your football team? Well, I think not only is it important for the coaches to, you know, for evaluation on a player, but I think it's important that in the long run that the parents of these kids, when they come in, are saying, you mean you're first in the nation in academic All-American? <laughs> You know, and you're, and the second school is Notre Dame, and you're 25 to 50 kids ahead of them. You know that that makes somebody think a little bit, because I know guys. If you talk about intelligence, I can I can I was in charge of pro scouts. I used to kind of get the scores of the tests that they gave, and we had guys that were the number one guys in that whole testing class you know, that were there and guys that got grades that were out of sight. And so, you know, you, you, you know that it's the, number one is the school system starts from the beginning. And then if you follow through in the state, same with the university. I mean, a lot of times when you say Nebraska, you're thinking, you know, if you're a kid from the east, you kind of think, you know, I don't go out in a wheat field or a corn field or, a, you know, <laughs> go out and see what beans look like. You know, that sometimes it, it makes a big difference when all of a sudden people say, whoa, wait a second. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is is that it's not a – for a lot of kids, they don't want to go to school at a huge, huge university where, you, you know, it's like you're a number, not a person. Coach, uh, when it comes to in-state recruiting, how, how do you have an effective relationship – not only with the in-state kids, 
but also with the in-state high school coaches? What's the, not the secret, but what's, What's the uh, what's the successful route to take where you can can be able to show up to a, a small town or, or a big town and and be able to get info on kids that you want to keep home? Right. I think a lot of times what happens is that it spreads out of not only from the coach or the high head coach, it spreads out through the community. Uh, when they when the coach has a lot of connections. Because it is small, it has, it, at lunchtime they may go eat somewhere with guys and they talk about it. That person goes and talks about it. And it gets back to the parents. You know, that we hear your son is this, and man, boy, that would be great if he went to Nebraska. That, just that saying it that way and saying that kind, you know, that you're, you know, hey, they're really interested in our son, and it would be nice, you know, and this and that, but. Uh, that that's what those coaches are, are really important, and assistant coaches. I mean, are really important. I think one of the things that uh, I found out how important it was when I retired. I went out there Arizona, and I I know some of the coaches out there. I got involved as a member of the. I was actually a board member emeritus of the State High School Coaches Association. And I got to talk to a lot of guys and talk to a lot of coaches how they did it. And some coaches came into the staff and did clinics for their coaches. And it really, it, especially the in-state guys, mm-hmm. it really helps. You know, sometimes it, you know it'll take the summer. It'll say, hey, I'll stop by and if you want to get your coaches together. I'd be glad to talk to you about it. You know, and things like that. So you have an advantage that way of being close to them and keeping them as part of your, you know, so they feel part of your program. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I know that, that in Nebraska, Tom, you know, and I think the head coach is the guy that has to create that. Mm-hmm. And Tom did a great job. He went out himself and, and drove a car himself and recruited himself and, you know, and stuff like that. So, uh, he never let. He never would go with any of us in the first week of recruiting out. He was in the state the first week wow. of uh, that we were eligible to go out. You know, after the season, and he was he was trucking. I mean, <laughs> he looked, he looked like death warmed over coming in on Friday. But um, you know, he did it, and he did it every year. He did it, and and it really helps with the walk on program also. I just wonder, did T.O. ever get a speeding ticket? He, well, I was with him when he got one, but <laughs> I, I guess I'm not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> we'll continue this one, uh, the T.O. The <laughs> speeding ticket, next week. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I, don't know, I know one thing. They named the highway after him from Hastings to Grand Island. I can say this. He got one of the first tickets on it. <laughs> no way. <laughs> You can't, you, I guess Tom's not the type, but you can. Probably, you know who this highway is named after? Yeah. <laughs> That's. Well, yeah. I think his wife might have got one too. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Well, I'm in good company then. Nice, uh, Charlie McBride with us, Coach. You have a good uh, rest of your week, and we'll check in next Monday. Okay, bud. Okay. Well, we hope we hope we don't get to a point where we go over the top or something. That's scary but uh, <laughs> if it happens it happens right yeah you take okay. care coach thanks, thanks again for having me uh-huh. guys. i appreciate it okay bye now there is Charlie. mr black shirt charlie mcbride good to spend time with him on hail varsity we'll uh hear from matt schick college world series nebraska recruiting hour two continues with hail varsity and now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. We welcome in with ESPN and of course Sirius XM. Matt Schick with us, uh, Schick and Nick show. Of course, the podcast you catch with Herd at uh, Schick. How's the summer, man? Are you um, scheming, plotting, strategizing for uh, a championship run on the diamond? There's a lot of things happening here right now. Great to be with you. Um, there's nothing more coveted than a 9U 
All Stars District Championship. Um, you can go down the list: NBA Finals, uh, College World Series, whatever. But it begins and ends with nine U districts, and so it's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, those are held 45 minutes from our lovely abode, and so it's daily trips to a place called Huntersville, North Carolina. And uh, I tell you, we had a heartbreaker last weekend. Uh, we were down four nothing, came back, took the lead. We're up six five. Lead uh, bottom of the sixth inning. I mean, this is it. Tied first and second. Nobody out. And uh, four hole hitter pops out. Next guy line drive left field diving catch from a kid, and uh, winds up doubling off our runner who made a boneheaded mistake. And we wound up losing the game, guys. I mean, the kids have wash their hands of that game right now. I mean, this was three days ago, right, uh, or two nights ago. Uh, but I'm probably going to live with that one for a while. Kids are playing Fortnite, and I'm uh, settled in for a Fortnite of grief. <laughs> well, you'll uh, you'll walk it off, I'm sure. Uh, there's <laughs> times that, that, you know, Whitey Herzog had his moments. Don Zimmer had his moments. Um and, and it worked out okay. Tony La Russa, God knows, has had yeah, his I mean, moments. You mentioned, you mentioned, um, you know, it's like Don Zimmer. It's like, you know, as long as I don't get thrown to the ground by Pedro Martinez, I'll be fine. You know, I'll be fine. <laughs> you know, the last thing you want. That, Words that, of wisdom. <laughs> that ruined it for me because I loved Zim growing up and I loved watching Pedro. And then when they clashed to see the old man get spiked, um, <laughs> that, that made me weep a little bit, Chick. Yeah. Tough to see your it's tough to see your favorite and your legends grow old and then tumble uh, getting beat up by a guy thirty years younger. It's really hard. Uh, well, a lot going on. College football is going to be here before we know it. But want to get your take? You did a lot of coverage this year of college baseball and just an awesome college World Series, and then two blowouts to end it. How do you remember the twenty twenty three CWS? The uh, the 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 landing or kind of the the ride it was yeah i think it was the best i've ever seen uh since covering it since being around it since living there um so that that's going till about 2002 ish mm-hmm. is when i started uh, covering it so more than 20 years best i've seen there was really nothing that could happen in the finals that was going to uh detract from that and i mean Case in point, a couple of nearly twenty-point margins and twenty-one runs margins, and you're and you're okay with it. Um, it wasn't. It was kind of a thud at the end, but uh, the star power going in. I remember doing a bunch of uh, interviews and talking about it and previewing it after the selection show, and then going into the the CWS saying with the with the the storylines and the draft picks and the brand names. And the, National Seas, it had the makings for one of the best we've seen, and it wound up being the best I've ever seen. So I'm fine with it. Would have loved to have seen something a little more akin to what we saw earlier, but um, hats off to LSU. They showed why they were uh, a number one team early on in the year. Uh, and Matt, we, uh, we're getting some of the early viewership numbers out of Game 3 from last night. It was the top telecast of the day, broadcast or cable, with 3.4 million viewers, meaning uh, Game 3 of the College World Series actually outdrew last week's NBA draft. And I want to get your take on just what the, the national perception is around the College World Series. Do you, do you think that the, the game has been grown to a point now where people around the country want to watch the College World Series? Because I remember... Growing up, it always felt like something that, that Nebraskans cared more about than the rest of the country, but I feel like the rest of the country is starting to, to catch up with Nebraska's interest in the College World Series every single year. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think, um, you know, it felt different this year. I, I, it, the, the hype felt better. The attention felt more, uh, I guess, zoned in nationally. And maybe that's because I can remember doing live shots outside Rosenblatt and um, – back in the day for KETV Channel 7, and also knowing, okay, when are we going on? Because the NBA Finals are still going on. Uh, We're on late. We're on ABC, so we're on late. There's no NBA Finals uh, here to detract from it. Um, That that, I feel like that that ended months ago, even though it was a couple of weeks, but it ended in a perfect time for the College World Series to just take center stage. What else was there to watch? And so... You know, outside of the NBA draft, like you said. So I think it, the timing of everything is working out, um, and, um, and it couldn't have come at a better time. You just hope that 
you know, as a Big Ten guy myself, you're just kind of left going, it'd be great to have a little more diversity, to use the 2023 word, um, to, you know, to grow the sport a little bit more. But, um, but all that being said, this series couldn't have come at a better time for the sport. It was magical. You've got the, the name value and brand value mixed in, and, and it was exciting. You saw great players do their thing, and the storylines were, were a lot of fun. It was great to be up there last week just outside of there doing uh, all the shows we did, and I know you've covered it and been on a, on a national level with it for, for so long. It's been impressive. Now, the here and now for Nebraska is to get – uh, mm-hmm. Competitive in the Big Ten and 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 be in it uh, when it comes to conference tournament time, so they can get uh, get back to some regionals. What what have you seen from from your region? But you're also a guy that's been in the Midwest. Just what's your take on youth baseball? Let me ask you that as a coach of nine year olds. But you also see some of the older kids are kids bigger, faster, stronger than when you and I were swinging and missing or connecting, of course. Yeah, I don't know what league you were in. I was hitting bombs, but um, <laughs> no, none of that's true. Uh, a bunch of swing and miss over here. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, being here in Charlotte and in the Southeast, you, you know, they played baseball 12 months a year. Mm-hmm. You know, I was growing up in Rochester, New York, and then, um, you know, and then in Maryland where I lived, you know, you're in the Northeast and you're, you're, you're playing in the spring. You're not playing in the fall. You're playing in from April, May, June, three months. You know, maybe March you're starting practice or starting opening day. And once summer hits, you're done. You're not playing baseball anymore. And I'm talking the youth rec level, like youth up until about 12. And, and when I was when we were growing up, Schmitty, like travel ball isn't what it is right now. No, like you had like, like two teams. Now you have 2,000 yeah, teams. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you had, rec, you had Little League and that was it. You didn't think about doing anything else. And now, if you're not specializing or, you know, on uh, Mission Baseball or SBA or whatever the, the the new team is, by the age of nine or ten, you know, you feel like something's wrong with your kid. So, but here in Charlotte, it's you got Little League in the fall, you got Little League in the spring. Um, you know, we played, we had our championship rec games in November. And if you think I mentioned the word championship to let you know we won it, you're correct. Um, but that was... September, October, November, the season went, and right before Thanksgiving, we wrapped up. You're not doing that in Nebraska. You're not doing that in Michigan, uh, New York. So that that helps a lot. And then the other thing that's really tough for Midwest teams and Midwest schools is that you are the, – the NIL that has taken over college athletics has permeated college baseball to the point where it is going to be really difficult – for the Big Ten to catch up unless they decide to divert a lot of resources to the sport, unless there is a streamlined start date that lines up where Big Ten teams can actually open the season at home instead of on the road for six weeks. Like There are things that make playing in the Big Ten unattractive, and that's one of it. Um, you can't control the weather, at least not yet. Maybe we've made progress on that. But the SEC, I mean, Tommy White goes from NC State to LSU. And you're kidding yourself if you don't think that there was a, some money involved in that. Um, Thatcher Hurd goes from UCLA to LSU. He gives away his NIL money, uh, which was great for him, uh, but that's fairly uncommon. But the point being, the, the players that have good seasons in the Midwest and look like they could be SEC caliber are going to play eventually in the SEC, unless the Big Ten can nip this in the bud. Maybe UCLA coming over to the Big Ten will help some of that. Maybe it'll simply hurt UCLA. But um, this is one of those tipping point moments in college baseball where the SEC's takeover mode is 100% right now. They should have won you know, a half dozen in a row, if not for a drop foul ball in Arkansas. And you're staring down the barrel of it if you're the Big Ten going, you got a decision to make um, if, if you want to be good at this thing. Because otherwise, the College World Series will be the SEC Invitational. And and the ACC with a couple of good teams there uh, for years to come. Matt Schick's with us here, Hale Varsity Radio. And Matt, in your opinion, is it feasible for, for Husker baseball and, and Husker baseball fans to think that college, making a College World Series 
could be an expectation for this Husker baseball team. After all we've seen, I mean, Michigan's been the only team that's made the College World Series field from the Big Ten since Nebraska's joined, and that Michigan team needed to catch some lightning in a bottle that season to make the field. Is it possible in your mind for Husker baseball to go and make the College World Series field being in the Big Ten? Possible, yes. Realistic, no. Um, I, I think it's just as realistic as the, for the football team to make the 14 playoff as it is for the baseball team to make the 18 College World Series. Uh, I think they're, they're not too far apart if they're disparate at all. Um, the, 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 trouble in the, Big Ten, the trouble in the Big Ten comes with the RPI, comes with the metrics. Um, and if you're playing series in the Big Ten, like, there, are a lot of te- there are a lot of teams that you play that you can't lose a game, let alone you have to win the series. You've got to sweep. Some of these losses will hurt you. So unless you can game the RPI – uh, or unless that system changes, or unless the format changes, where they take a page out of the Mike Rooney handbook and go, hey, we're going to set a four-team regionals uh, at 16 sites. We're going to do 32 best two out of three sites and, and make that you know, help grow the sport in that way. But the metrics in baseball, really, uh, you, you are, the Big Ten hurts you um, and playing in that league, and there's really no, no way around it. I mean, look at Maryland. They go out and win the Big Ten. What's their reward? Go on the road and, and play Wake Forest, the number one overall seed. Like, you're, not, you're not getting out of that. And that's what the best the, best the Big Ten has to offer. You know, Indiana goes to Kentucky. You know, maybe had an opportunity to win that. They don't. Um, you know, Iowa goes to Indiana State. Can't get over that hump. So there's, there's just a lot there that is working against this league. And you know, when you're going up against leagues that have eight, nine, ten teams into the field, and you're getting three or four at the most, and you're not hosting regionals, well, that's where this comes down to. Can you host a regional? Can you host a super? And the numbers tell you it's unrealistic for the Big Ten to do that um, unless they catch lightning in a bottle. Unless Maryland beats UConn last year in the regional final, then they likely host the super. Outside of that, it's, uh, it's going to be really challenging unless you're able to go on the road and win on the road. A few minutes here, Mid- Matt Schick with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Uh, we'll check in another segment with Schick coming up. On Hale Varsity, we're presented by Currency. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Matt Schick's with us. ESPN, of course, Sirius XM, Schick and Nick podcast at ESPN underscore Schick's, where you find him on Twitter. Matt, I know you do uh, uh, weekly and daily Sirius XM shows. What did they get your take on, on you know, what's next for the Big Ten specifically in this playoff era before it expands. You got one more rodeo with the West and the East, but interested to see, and uh, I guess your, your stock value in Michigan, do you think they're ready to take that step, and are they still the team to make that step for the Big Ten and, and win a championship for the first time since, well, Zeke and company did for Ohio State? Yeah, I, I think they're, um, they're positioned – to assert themselves again this year. Uh, it starts with the lines of scrimmage. Uh, I'm not sure how the defensive front will replace a couple of their key guys, but I know the offensive line is going to be top five in the nation. Um, I, I think that the interesting thing about Michigan is, and we talked about this on the Big Ten radio a program uh, that I host in the mornings on Sirius XM that you referenced, is that they, they started doing this uh, Georgia, beat Georgia period in Michigan practice. And when I read that, I thought, my, how, how has this program transformed to the point where, yes, you're still focused on Ohio State, but now you're not punching up at Ohio State. You're punching past them to Georgia. Um, and you haven't played Georgia in two years. But what did they just see? They saw, they saw Michigan themselves beat Ohio State handily uh, with some big plays, but handily in the fourth quarter and then saw that same Ohio State team nearly beat Georgia. So right now, they're, they're, they got their sights set on, hey, we know we can beat Ohio State. They, they might be more of a speed bump than, a road, than the roadblock they used to be, but we know, we know we can beat Ohio State. We have to beat Georgia and teams like Georgia if we want to win a national championship. And, uh, yeah, they're not doing the beat TCU drill. They know they beat themselves in that national semifinal last year. Now it's time to compare yourselves with the best of the best. That's still Ohio State, but you've proven you can do it. So I think Michigan has transformed themselves into thinking that they can 
and will win the Big Ten. Their over-under is 10 and a half. And if you take the under, you're saying they're not winning the Big Ten. I, I think they, they're going to be the favorite to win it. they got the known commodity at quarterback, and they're, they're in reload mode right now. Their non-conference does not include Notre Dame, which, uh, which it does for, no, for Ohio State. So I think if you're, you're a Michigan fan, you're feeling really good. And, you know, if you're a Nebraska fan, you're probably like, why not us? Matt Chick's with us here at Hale Varsity Radio. And Matt, since last we chatted, we got a 2024 and 2025 conference schedule for the Big Ten. And we've also seen USC has put the Big Ten branding on their jerseys for the recruits coming in and visiting campus. And I want to get your take mostly on USC, but also UCLA. Are those two schools going to be contenders in the Big Ten as soon as they join? Or do you think there's going to be a, a, a readjustment period a la Nebraska after its first couple of years in the Big Ten? I think USC will be an annual competitor. I don't think there's any question about it. Um, uh, but but it will also be the kind of thing that will – how will their conference affiliation impact them in recruiting? I think USC is still going to be the – it was for many years, like if you're in SoCal and you're in California, you're on the West Coast, you belong to USC. And then that took a dip for a while. And now with Lincoln Riley, I think they're turning back to that. But how will the Big Ten affiliation impact that? That's a wait-and-see deal. Um, but uh, I think for the foreseeable future, as long as Lincoln Riley is there, you know they're going to have a quarterback, and that's where it all starts. Uh, their defense is going to improve this year, and I think they'll get a nice springboard into next year. It'll be interesting to see, though, what happens to quarterback a year from now. But, I, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it, it's going to be yet another challenger for the middle-of-the-road teams in the Big Ten to have to face. And I think UCLA will be fine, too. Uh, I think Chip Kelly's kind of proven his medal that he actually knows what he's what he's doing and didn't become an idiot overnight. But um, yeah, if you're if you're USC, um, you're you're fairly confident going in. At the same time, as a college football fan, I look at the schedules and I I say to myself, I don't I don't know how you get through a schedule unless you're Ohio State or Michigan with fewer than three losses. I don't know how you do it. Uh, and that might be good enough to make the playoff, but your margin for error is still pretty slim. I mean, you, you go into the that that twelve team playoff, don't you? These games that are winnable, you better win them, because there's going to be enough landmines along the way to to prevent you from getting in. You know, Matt Rule's philosophy has been fit. It's been to test, inv- you know, invite kids, test them if they like them, and and there's a mutual interest you you offer, and Nebraska's done it all they've gotten some high profile recruits they've won some of those recruiting battles they've also got guys that haven't really been offered by a lot of names but we've also seen nebraska offer a kid and then some other big boys start offering what do you make of of nebraska's uh, recruiting uh, setup now under rule and how they're going about their business there's all over the board in a good way, whether you're a high star prospect or not, it, it seems like they're using their evaluation techniques pretty well. Uh, it's the best it's been in a long time. I think they're, uh, they're set up the way they're pursuing guys, the way that they're establishing their in-state. I mean, I, it's, um, it's, it's pretty impressive to see what they've been able to do in a, in a short period of time. Um, and shoring up the in-state guys for sure. Um, but it is, we talk about it being all about relationships, and that's what it used to be. Now the conversation is about, and coaches will tell you, and coaches that I've spoken with, um, NIL isn't a part of the conversation. It is the conversation. Um, but it seems like Nebraska is set up to win and we be willing to have those conversations uh, with what they've got on the outside and the periphery with that. And, and also, I think there's some good signs that you see when, you know, you're, you're establishing those relationships in Texas that they have, but you're also making sure that your backyard is being mined for the best. And when you get a Daniel Kalen, when you get when you get teammates, you know, in-state, wide-out teammates going, you know what, let's go play together, um, that kind of thing matters. And that tells you that a guy that just showed up at your front door uh, and you didn't know him, is now getting you to buy the entire catalog. That's pretty good. Um, and now imagine what happens when he's actually been in the state for a year. I mean, he just got there in December. So uh, I think that's promising. And I think the, the recruiting that they're doing is um, encouraging, to say the very least. It's just a matter of 
of sustainability. Here, here's what they know is that, you know, if you're going to be a national program, you still have to mind that 500 mile radius. Cause the further you go from home, the less you're likely to hold on to these guys, i.e. Scott Frost trying to recruit the state of Florida. Yeah. Like you got to be able to, to get guys locally and develop. And, and I think Matt rule understands we're not going to get the five stars, but we have to figure out a way to recruit, retain and develop. And NIL is going to be a part of that, and their coaching staff is going to be a huge part of that. Um, and I think they're on their way. Oh, on their way to what? I'm not ready to say anything there, but uh, but I think that the first six months couldn't go any better. Matt Schick with us from ESPN and Sirius XM. Good to spend time with Matt Schick. Of course, Schick and Nick podcast can get that subscription and catch it on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play with the Herdad family of podcasts. So check that out. We'll wind out with Matt Schick. We'll get into that barbecue discussion with Schick in a little bit, but great perspective there uh, from a national standpoint on Nebraska recruiting. Reminder about buckling up. Use your seatbelt. It saves lives. It prevents injuries only if properly worn. Buckle up. A message from the the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office will put a bow on Tuesday with Hale Varsity Radio. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Matt Schick's with us. ESPN, of course, Sirius XM, Schick and Nick podcast. Schick will get you out on this. Thanks for the time. Uh, top 10 barbecue ratings came out that uh, we were talking about this morning. No North Carolina cities, no South Carolina love. Uh, mistake or dare you say accurate when we talk about barbecue ratings? Well, who's doing this, right? Like, who is doing the ratings? That's really the question. It's like when I always ask, who's who's promoting what online and uh, and if they and, and then you have to find out how much money are they making by what they're promoting right uh, we, we all know that in society who's telling you what to do and how much money they're making from doing it so tell me who is who is doing this poll who's doing the rating it was kind of a buzzfeed type deal <laughs> okay all right well that doesn't really help um (laughs) you know uh, we've got some pretty good barbecue here um the improper pig is a chain out here that people love Uh, i'm not a huge barbecue guy i like to fire up the queue Mm -hmm. um but the problem is when you've got young kids like young kids are not like hey let's go out for barbecue like hey let's go out for chicken nuggets and i'm like well i said no nuggets fellas like i don't want to do that right now (laughs) but they are not they're not huge on the queue so we're trying to get them there but there are some great places in charlotte there are some great places in north carolina carolina barbecue to me i mean if you go barbecue north carolina there are a three dozen things that pop up on your map. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I would know cause I live here and I just clicked on the map. So, uh, I think it's probably shady from Buzzfeed. I wouldn't trust anything Buzzfeed does. Kansas city, St. Louis, Memphis. I mean, some of the, the, the known hot spots, Austin, Omaha made it, but no, uh, uh Omaha made it over Carolina. I, there's nothing from North Carolina. I don't have the the sheet in front of me, but North Carolina, more vinegar based. I was in vinegar. And then you I was have, in you Winston the, the Salem. Carolina Gold Sauce. Too. Yeah, I was in Winston Salem last year, and I tried their barbecue. I thought it was good, but I'm more of a dry rub guy. Can you get a camera in front of Dana Altman and, and Nick Baugh and just buy a twenty piece of nuggets and just see how it goes? That would be great. Like I would love for Dana Altman to watch Nick Baugh eat nuggets and just see what happens. I think that'd be great. Listen to the chicken egg pod to figure out what we're talking about, but I think it's a great idea. Uh, and get the barbecue sauce. Uh, Matt Schick with us. Uh, Matt, you take care, bud. Thanks for a few minutes today. All right, guys. Anytime. Take care. Good stuff from Matt Schick, Schick and Nick. And uh, the funny part of any Schick and Nick show is their hilarity. Not only are they super talented and no sports, but they're funny, and then they crack each other up. And then it's an hour of crack-ups, like Dana Altman losing his mind on chicken nuggets. Yeah, and I have I have had this explained to me. Uh-huh. So Funny check that. Story. Check I, that. I, we'll, we'll have to drop that story and, tomorrow. And, and, no, I'm not going to do any spoilers. Here. Go check out the Shake and Nick podcast. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't want to take away from it, that. That's it, a funny it, story. It was, it was, it was comedy gold. Recruiting Nebraska Ainsworth noon high noon tomorrow. 
Brady Altman's going to be on hand there for Hale Varsity. We will borrow Brady Altman's probably at a truck stop. Hopefully, he's going to be hammering chicken fried steak or Salisbury steak at a truck stop. Chicken nuggets? No. <laughs> <laughs> but th- there are options. We talked barbecue, of course. But Brady's going to join us at 5 tomorrow night. We'll spend time with Evan Bland, Mike Babcock with us. Uh, Big thanks today to Matt Schick, Coach McBride, Mitch Sherman. Talk to you tomorrow at 4.